Friends, our call to worship for today is based on Exodus 15 and Isaiah 6. If you're in the uh, YouTube uh, live stream, you can click on the participants guide and your words will be in the bold in the call to worship and other parts of the service. If you're here in person, it'll be on the screen for us today. Dear friends, God invites us into his healing presence with these words, I am the Lord who heals you. Diseased, depressed, dysfunctional, defeated, we come hungering for health that only God can provide. God calls us to bring open eyes, hearing ears, and tender hearts, torn, turned toward him, the great physician. We bow before him in faith and expectancy. O oh God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, help us so to know you, so to love you that we may faithfully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now is the time to worship God with the Psalms. This book of the Bible called the Psalms used to be the only songbook in the church for many Christian traditions for many years. As I said last week, the Psalms and the Psalms alone were sung as worship to God. So while we cannot sing the Psalms this morning, we can say them aloud together. So today I invite you to join me in this responsive reading of Psalm 146. Your parts are in bold. Lord, receive our worship with Psalm 146. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are those who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed, and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Blessed indeed are they who put their trust in you, O God, our sure rock and refuge. Guard us from giving to any other the allegiance that belongs only to you. Shine upon us with the brightness of your light that we may love you with a pure heart and praise you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. My friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Well, Pastor Andy had a children's uh, moment prepared, but he's in Earl Park with his mom last night, and they are flooded in, and so uh, we'll, I don't know if you heard about that, but we'll uh, add our prayers, lots of flood warnings in that area, so um, he said he's on his way because they just opened up the, the highway, but obviously he's not here, so I don't really have any cool things I can do for you. Sorry, Ella. <laughs> Ella, do you want to do the children's blessing today? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and go into our time of uh, reflection on, on the Word of God. Dear friends, our scripture reading for today begins with the phrase, Dear friends. Peter has already said some hard things in his first letter to the persecuted and scattered Christians in the first century. He's even said some things they didn't like. Chapter 1, verse 14, he says their former ways of life were ignorant. I don't think any of us like being called ignorant, but that's what Peter says. But he's saying these difficult things to them 
as their friend. And so he begins this difficult section of his letter, the one we're about to read, with the words, Dear Friends. Dear Friends is a good start to what I have to say today as well. I may say some things you don't like. I have probably already said some things in the past that were hard for you to hear, perhaps some things you didn't agree with. By God's grace, you are still here. (laughs) But I want you to know that I'm saying it as your friend. I'm trying my best to be faithful to Jesus and his gospel. And out of love for you, I'm attempting to say something that is true. I know I'm not always right, but in the deepest part of my heart, I am for you, not against you. I am with you as one who is under the word of God, as one who is equally challenged by the word of God. And I am your friend. Dear friends, Peter begins, as he instructs the persecuted and scattered church in this new section of teaching. We're in chapter 2, verse 11, as we make our way through 1 Peter. So let us listen to what follows, and let us be open and willing to be stretched and challenged this morning. As always, we pray first for God's help. Dear Jesus, who calls us your friends, we approach your scriptures this morning trusting the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 3, that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Holy Spirit, open our minds to your teaching. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to your rebuking and correcting. Holy Spirit, make us willing to be trained by you and how to live rightly and wisely in this strange, complicated world. We pray this not just for our sake, but for your glory and for the advance of your mission in the world, Jesus. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from the book that we love, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 11. Dear friends, since you are immigrants and strangers in the world, I urge you, to avoid worldly desires that wage war against your lives. Live honorably among the unbelievers. Today they defame you as if you were doing evil, but in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him because they have observed your honorable deeds. For the sake of the Lord, submit to every human institution. Do this whether it means submitting to the emperor as supreme ruler or to governors as those sent by the emperor. They are sent to punish those doing evil and to praise those doing good. Submit to them because it's God's will that by doing good, you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Do this as God's slaves and yet also as free people not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Have respectful fear of God. Honor the emperor. Household slaves, submit by accepting the authority of your masters with all respect. Do this not only to good and kind masters, but also to those who are harsh. Now, It is commendable. If, because of one's understanding of God, someone should endure pain through suffering unjustly, but what praise comes from enduring patiently when you have sinned and are beaten for it? But if you endure steadfastly when you've done good and suffer for it, this is commendable before God. You were called to this kind of endurance because Christ suffered on your behalf. He left you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor did he ever speak in ways meant to deceive. When he was insulted, he did not reply with insults. When he suffered, he did not threaten revenge. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He carried in his own body on the cross the sins we committed. (laughs) 
he did this so that we might live in righteousness, having nothing to do with sin. By his wounds, you are healed. Though you were like straying sheep, you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your lives. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a reason Peter says what he says. There are two reasons, in fact, why Peter says what he says about submission and honor. Before I tell you the reasons, you have to understand the context. We must understand the context, the nature of first century slavery, if we are to understand the passage. If not, we will misunderstand the passage and misread and misapply. So here's the context, and then the two reasons why Peter says what he says about honor and submission and slaves. When the Romans conquered territories far and wide around the time of Jesus, they claimed possession of the people in those territories. They took away their rights and they called them slaves. Now these slaves did all kinds of work. Listen to this. These slaves in the Roman Empire were doctors and teachers and musicians and actors and secretaries and so forth. They were slaves. Not generally what we think of when we think of a slave, but whatever role they used to serve in their community, now they served for Rome. As one scholar writes, the the Roman attitude was that there was no point in being master of the world and doing one's own work. (laughs) So, as the Romans took over, because they were stronger than everyone else, they made others slaves and made them do their work. Now, some of these slaves were treated well by their masters, even treated like members of their own family. But others, as our scripture passage informs us, were treated harshly. And by the time of Peter's letter, the Roman Empire had over 60 million slaves put this in perspective, the U.S. had 3.2 million slaves in the year 1850. Now, some of those slaves under the Roman Empire were followers of Jesus. In fact, there's reasonable evidence to assume that many, if not most, Christians in the early church, in the New Testament times, they were slaves of some sort. This means that the letter we've been exploring the past several weeks is a letter written to Christians who are not only persecuted for their faith, but also enslaved because they weren't Romans. They were enslaved because they were on the wrong side of the Roman Empire's thirst for power. So when Peter instructs household slaves in our text, when he instructs them to submit by accepting the authority of their masters, he's not talking about other people. He's not talking about slavery in theory, he's addressing the people who will receive his letter. Christians who are not only scattered and persecuted, but also who are slaves. So that's the context. But why does he say it? Why does he put it like that? It sounds so harsh to modern ears, at least it sounds harsh to mine. Household slaves, he says, submit by accepting the authority of your masters with all respect. Do this not only to good and kind masters, but also to those who are harsh. Seriously, Peter? (laughs) Are you in cahoots with the Romans? Whose side are you on, anyways? Those were valid questions for those hearing these words from Peter. So there are two reasons, I think, why Peter says what he says. First, he says what he says because he cares about non-Christians. Second, he says what he says because he cares about Christians. I'll explain that now. Let's start with reason number one. Peter says what he says about submission to authority because he cares about non-Christians, about those who have not heard or embraced the good news that Christ has come, God has come, in the person of Christ, to save the world. <laughs> he cares about Christians. Now, verse 12 is critical here, okay? It says this. It says, Live honorably among the unbelievers. Today they defame you. They ridicule you as if you were doing evil. But in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him 
because they have observed your honorable deeds. So it wasn't just that non-Christians in Peter's day thought the church was irrelevant. That's what many think about the church today. It's irrelevant. But that wasn't their view. They despised the church. They believed that the church was the source of all kinds of evils. They spread rumors about the church that were untrue. They, uh, they heard about the, the meal of the Lord's Supper, eating the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, and they said that's cannibalism, <laughs> and they accused the Christians of awful things like this. So for this reason, they persecuted the strange followers of Jesus. So Peter's a leader in the church. How is the church to respond to such persecutions? How is the church to respond to such rumors and injustices done to them? Well, Peter's solution is counterintuitive. It wasn't to fight back with words or swords. It wasn't to form political alliances with the secular government. It was to follow the example of Jesus and submit. It was to follow the example of Jesus who submitted to the unjust verdict of the empire and endured this cross at the hands of evil people, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. But in doing so, in doing so, Jesus transformed the hearts of his persecutors. The hearts of those who witnessed how he suffered with dignity and poise, they were transformed. Remember how the Gospel of Matthew put it, chapter 27, verse 54. It says, now when the centurion, which was the Roman soldier, now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly this man was the Son of God. Their hearts were changed because of the way Jesus suffered with poise and dignity. So, as hard as it is, Peter commends to his people, to his flock, the example of Jesus. He commends to the persecuted first century church, some of whom were slaves also. He tells them to live honorably among the unbelievers. And when they get a feel for what you're really about, some of them will change their minds. Some of them will embrace the truth. Some of them will become followers of Jesus and join the family. And that's what Peter really wanted. So that's why he says what he says. And that's actually what happened. If you read the history, people did see the suffering of Christians. They saw how their suffering imitated the suffering of Jesus. And that's how the gospel went from a tiny minority to expanding and expanding and expanding. Peter cares about non-Christians. So he instructs the Christians to do what he believes is necessary to transform the hearts of the non-Christian. Now we see this same logic in verse 15 when Peter writes, he says this, he says, submit to them, here's why, submit to them because it's God's will that by doing good you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Silence the ignorant talk foolish people. You see, Peter did not think the Romans were doing what was right and just. He did not support the Roman government or agree with the terrible Roman emperor, who at the time was the vicious and capricious tyrant named Nero. Remember the guy responsible for blaming the Christians for the great fire of Rome, launching the attack on Christians? He did not support him. <laughs> he did not support the empire, just because it was an authority. Instead, what's verse 15 says? He thinks they are ignorant, foolish people, but he's learned from Jesus that the way to silence the oppressor was to live honorably among them, to do good, to kill hatred with kindness, to show that all their lies and misunderstandings about them are not true. By the purity of their character, they would change their minds. That's what he learned from Jesus. And he knows sometimes this will mean suffering for doing what's right, 
and entrusting the end result to God who judges all people justly. But I don't want to push the case too far. While Peter does not approve of the injustices of the Roman Empire, because the God of justice does not approve of them, he doesn't hate them for it. Instead, he is compelled by a surprising love for his enemies. That's something else he learned from Jesus. Enemy love. So much so that he wants them to be saved. He wants them to experience the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. He wants them, as verse 12 says, to glorify God when God visits to judge the earth. And Peter knows that the only way the persecutors are going to be transformed is by the undeserved kindness and honorable living demonstrated to them by the persecuted Christians. It's a hard word for persecuted Christians to hear. But Peter cared that much about non-Christians that it was worth suffering for them that they might come to a knowledge of the truth. And I wonder if we care this much about non-Christians. Sometimes I wonder if we even care about them at all. Do we want the non-Christians in our lives to experience the mercy and grace of God? Do we want this for them? Or would we rather they experience the judgment of God? Because frankly, we don't like them. If we say we care about non-Christians, and I think most of us would, then I wonder how far we are willing to go to demonstrate the love of God for them. Peter commends the example of Jesus to the persecuted, enslaved Christians of his day. How far were they willing to go to show the love of God to non-Christians? Well, following Jesus' example meant that it would include pain, and loss, and sacrifice, and suffering. He calls them to love their persecutors in obedience to Jesus' command to love one's enemy. That's how far they were to go. And by the authority of God, Peter asks them to be willing to endure suffering in their bodies for the sake of their enemies' souls. Are we prepared to follow Peter's recommendation too? Or are we apathetic? and different to the lives of those who are far from God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, help us. I want to explore a little more what it means to live honorably among unbelievers. The Greek word here for honorable is kalos. Can you say that with me? Kalos or kalos, I don't know. (laughs) It means good. Live good lives among unbelievers. But it means more than that, too. And I want you to get this. As one New Testament scholar writes, kalos, or kalos, means, it means not only good, but also lovely, fine, attractive, winsome. So what Peter is saying is that the Christian must make his whole way of life so lovely and so good to look upon that the slanders of his enemies may be demonstrated to be false. Is your life attractive to the non-Christian? I'm not talking about the superficial things, nice cars, big houses. That's not what makes our lives attractive to non-Christians. But I'm talking about our character, the way we treat other people, the way we are in public and the way we are in private. Is our lives, are our lives attractive to the non-Christians? Is the way you talk about your faith winsome to the unbeliever? When outsiders get an insider look at your life, will they want for themselves what they see in you? That's what it means to live honorably among unbelievers. If we don't do this, if we're not doing this, then we will not change the public's opinion about today's Christians. And I don't know if you know, but it's not very good. 
So here is a timeless truth, Barclay writes. Whether we like it or not, every Christian is an advertisement for Christianity. By his life, he either commends it to others or makes them think less of it. The strongest missionary force in the world is a Christian life. So let your light shine before others, Jesus says, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Or as Peter says, live honorably among them so that when God visits to judge, they too will glorify God. Lord, have mercy and help us do what we cannot do on our own. Lord, change our desires and reorder our priorities to match the desires and priorities of Jesus, our master. Amen. Now, if you recall, I'm not done yet, don't worry. If you recall, I said there are two reasons why Peter says what he says. Two reasons why he gives the terribly difficult command to his brothers and sisters in Christ to submit to those in authority over them. The first reason is evangelism. The first reason is that he cares about non-Christians. The second reason is that he cares about Christians. He cares about the well-being of those to whom he's writing. Like any good shepherd, he wants to protect the flock to the best of his ability. And given the current circumstances, Peter believes the best way to protect the flock is to encourage them to honor and submit. Now, some are surprised that Peter does not tell them to abolish slavery or to run away. Some are surprised that God did not do for the first century Christians what God did for the Jews when they were enslaved in Egypt. And for the sake of justice, part of me wishes that God had. But the more I come to understand the first century world, the more I trust that Peter knew better. Of course he's did. His words are God-breathed, after all. And Peter knew, as did everyone else living under the mighty thumb of Rome, he knew that revolts against the empire were always quickly and savagely crushed. People tried, and it never got close to working. He also knew that a slave rebellion against their Roman masters would jeopardize their mission of telling them about Jesus. And in God's mysterious providence, the time had not yet come for the abolition of slavery. It would come eventually. Just as it came for the people of God living in Egypt in the days of Moses. But Peter discerned that now was not the time. Certainly that was a hard pill to swallow for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in the first century. So his instructions, Peter's instructions, were intended to help his poor flock make the best out of a bad situation. In light of the context and in light of the greater work God wanted to do in the world, bringing all people under his saving embrace, he rightly calls them not to start a movement, but to honor and submit. These words were ones that Peter himself was willing to live by. Remember, will you, that Peter himself was persecuted by the Roman Empire, and in a tragic irony, he was crucified by the very people he was trying to help, just like Jesus. <laughs> so that's why Peter says what he says about honoring everyone and submitting to the authorities, even to harsh masters and even to the emperor Nero. He cares about non-Christians because he's learned Jesus' way of enemy love, and he cares about the Christians wanting to practically protect them given the circumstances of the day. May the Spirit of God give us the strength to care both for non-Christians and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Now if I was going to play it safe, I'd stop right there and call it a day. But I feel the need to say one more thing. It just does not seem right to me to preach on this passage and not mention the horrific ways it has been used and misused and misread to perpetrate injustice. So let's talk about it. For those who don't know, 
This scripture passage, among others, has been taken out of context to support slavery in America, started in the 17th century. Now, thanks to the work of the Christian historian Mark Knoll, who teaches at Wheaton College, you can actually read some of the sermons preached in those days to support slavery and some of the sermons preached against slavery. It's fascinating, the comparisons. Just Google the Civil War as a Theological Crisis, and you can uh, check those out. Now, the logic of the pro-slavery preachers was that since Peter commanded the first century slaves to submit to their masters, that meant it was okay for Christians to participate in the slave industry. I hope by now you can see for yourself how wrong this reading was. If I were to boil it down to one thing that's so wrong about this interpretation of 1 Peter, it's this. Peter calls Christians to suffer for the sake of non-Christians. By contrast, the American slave trade was the result of Christians calling non-Christians to suffer. You see the reverse? That's what makes it so wrong. Let me say a little more. In the first century, the Christians were not in power, but the non-Christians were. That's the context in which Peter is writing. He's calling his brothers and sisters in Christ to suffer like Christ for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of converting the non-Christian oppressor. And it worked over the course of 300 years. Peter himself was willing to do this, as I said, sacrificing his own life for the sake of the gospel. In short, Peter is communicating in his letter that Christians will suffer. But Christians are never to make others suffer. In fact, Christians are to come alongside those who are suffering and do what we can to alleviate it. That's the difference. I wonder what would have happened in the 17th century if those who were in power and called themselves Christians used their power as Jesus did. You remember Luke 4? to preach good news to the poor, to set the prisoner free, to liberate the oppressed. But instead of doing that, so-called Christians participated in the mass kidnapping of Africans and the mistreatment of human beings as things in order, in many cases, to build their own wealth, which resulted in the sad corruption of their own souls. Uh, the reason I'm telling you these things today is not just for the sake of historical interest. Dear friends, the effects of the wickedness of slavery are still with us. Jim Wallace calls this America's original sin. If we do not come to grips with it, the past will continue to haunt us and the church will remain divided on the basis of race. Now, if I wanted to play it safe, I'd stop right there. <laughs> but I must go on. Here's what I believe. Dear friends, I believe the task of racial, racial justice is central to the witness of the church in America, to the witness of non-Christians who are watching us, I believe the task of racial justice is central, not peripheral, to the mission of evangelism. I believe the witness of the church in America to non-Christians hinges on the ability or the inability to come together with our black and brown sisters and brothers in Christ and support one another in mutual love. Without this, I believe the church in America will continue to see more and more decline until we're finally willing to face the facts of history. Evangelism is my motivation for saying all this. Evangelism. This is not a political issue. This is an ethical issue and a biblical issue. And I'm prepared to demonstrate that at length if you'd like to know.
Uh, Ironically, it's the past misuse of our passage for today that hampers our efforts of evangelism still today. Interestingly enough, and I'll close with this, interestingly enough, MLK Jr. foresaw this very thing happening. He foresaw the decline in the American church that you now see on the charts. He foresaw the credibility of the American church being weakened by the division between black and white brothers and sisters in Christ. We say we are one body of Christ, and the watching world hears that. We say we are reconciled by the blood of Jesus. We say, as Ephesians 2 says, that the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down and that two people have become one. That's what they hear us saying. But that's not what it looks like is happening to the outside world. It's not what's happening, frankly. So, MLK Jr. writes about this in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Listen to some of his words. He writes, In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church, MLK says. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son and the grandson and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. He goes on. The judgment of God is upon the church as never before. This is in 1963. He says, If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, the one we talked about in our scripture passage, if the church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. Sixty years have passed, and we have not met the challenge of this decisive hour. And I believe the charts of the decline in the church are directly related to this. So I urge you, and I'm talking to myself too, as your friend, I urge us to be bold enough to listen. That's all. To listen to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are not white. I urge us to learn from them. I urge us to be humble and open-minded and tender-hearted toward them. Let them into your heart in the same way you have let me into yours. If you do this, non-Christians will start to take notice. If we do this, non-Christians will start to take notice that something is happening in the church that can only be explained by some greater power. And then we will have the opportunity to tell them side by side with our black and brown brothers and sisters in Christ about the amazing love in Jesus Christ that has brought two groups into one family, that has torn down the dividing wall of hostility, and that will be a glorious day indeed. But if we don't do this, If none of us in the white church humble ourselves and start listening and learning, I'm afraid our witness to the watching world will grow ever more pitiful. I think this church will die, and I think many other churches will die. And so it happens to be still the case that the challenge of this church is still in a decisive hour. The question is, will we rise up to meet it, dear friends? In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.